It's a pleasure to finally have you, Karambu Injera, of um, International Peace Initiatives, which you also call IPI. How did the International Peace Initiatives come about? It came about in 2002. And in 2002, um, I was in Kenya for my summer holiday. Um, I had gone to the US for my graduate studies the previous year. So I met up in 2002 when I came back home, I, I met a group of women meeting in my mother's compound. As you know, women do meet um, mm -hmm. to share ideas, to raise money, to buy each other kitchen um, items and things like that. So I met this group of about 35 women and um, I sat down and, you know, experienced their process. And then I said to them, is this all? You know, because the money they raised, they distributed amongst themselves. They, they, had a, they had a system of doing that. And then they kept some to buy a kitchen cutlery that they were buying for each other and stuff like that. And so I said to them, is that all? Because my, my, my thing was, are they keeping any money aside to save for when one of them needs school fees or one is sick and things like that? So uh, they told me, um, this is not all because seven of us okay. uh, recently uh, lost their husbands to, to what okay. I asked. And they, they were like, we don't know. Well, 2002, 2003, 2004, HIV and AIDS was a main thing in Kenya. Of course. And so yeah. I said, yeah, so I said, you need to go and find out what killed them. And they would say something like, um, you know, they don't like us to know even the doctor they went to see. We don't have the documents. Yeah. I said. Everything about Africa is always hush, hush. You keep things to yourself. <laughs> yeah, so I said, no, you have to go and find out so that if it's this disease, you know how to take care of yourself so your kid don't, uh, don't go to the streets because, you know, if you have kids don't have parents, the next place they, they, they go is to the streets. So they said um, they would do that. Um, so all, of, all the seven of them, they found that their husbands had died of HIV and AIDS, and all of them were positive. Wow. Two of them had young kids, and one of them was really, really ill. Okay. So um, I said to them, well, um, so that was the, the part of lost, uh, losing their husbands. The second part of this was they said, so seven of the kids of the women in that group were not going to school because their husbands were the income earners and so the kids were not going to school. Then uh, the, the, the ladies had no jobs, you know, the story. And so I said, so they said, can you help us uh, take our kids to school? And I said, hmm, I'm a struggling student myself in the US. So I don't know how I can help, but let me go and think. Why do you think they spoke to you? Why do you think this woman decided, okay, let's ask you for money to help send the kids to school? Because they think anybody who is going to school in the U.S. is wealthy. Okay. And they didn't know that I, to go through my, uh, call, uh, my graduate education, I applied for about 600 scholarships and I got only six. 600 so, scholarships? Absolutely. Actually, I think it's where, somewhere around a thousand. But I say I, I applied, literally, I mean, like I'm serious, like I applied for between 600 to 1,000 scholarships and I got six. And that's how I finished my graduate studies in the States without, without debt. Right. They thought that if I could afford to go to America, come back home and pay school fees, I had money. So I told them I am a student. I don't have money, but let me think pray and see what I can do. And truly, I got I could make Kenyan food in the States. So in September of 2002, November of 2002, I created something I called the Kenya Cultural Night. Okay. I invited people to come and I made a lot of Kenyan food. I got a group of African dramas to come and, you know, do some music. And I talked about Africa, my culture growing in a very patriarchal system. I talked about our food, talked about what 
we were doing about HIV and AIDS in Kenya and how it was affecting women and children. And I was able to raise um, $400 that night. And that is what enabled me to take those seven kids to school the following year in January. So at that point, when you went back to the U.S. and you now started having that brainwave? I tell you, when I fly, I th- that's when I think. So on the flight, when I was trying to think how to help those children, that is when I got the idea of making the cultural event. And actually, okay. it started with just cooking Kenyan food, invite people to come and they'll pay something at the gate. That's where the idea came from. And so when I went, I implemented it in November and I got some people to, to help me organize it, help me cook. And there it was. Wow, good on you. Well, what can I say? <laughs> Um, at the end of the day, the, the IPI, International Peace Initiatives, kicked off. And um, yeah. looking at the mission you know, of your organization, it has to do with promoting a culture of peace, change lives by educating and inspiring children, and that's yeah. through many of your projects. Now, the yeah. question is, how yeah. have you been able to achieve this, bearing yeah. in mind that your base, Kenya, and just like many other African countries, is riddled with um, communal conflict. And we know that the way children are, and when we look at Africa, children have to obey their parents. They can't be disobedient. Now, so how have you been able to harness all of this? Kenya is not riddled with communal conflict. It's not okay. riddled. When you use the word riddled, it looks like it's everywhere. I live in a community where we have various types of conflict. But really, the problem is not the conflicts because everybody and every community has conflicts. The main main thing here is how do people resolve those conflicts? So because conflicts are part of our life. So um, we are not riddled in the way the word riddled implies, but we have conflicts, but we look for ways to resolve resolve them. Number two, um, in my community... I feel like my parents didn't try to get me to obey them. They taught me respect. So it's not just about blind obedience. It's about respecting them as my parents, but also as elders, as I'm expected to respect all elders in my community. Um, However, I can say that um, I have been able to achieve what I have achieved because, first of all, even though I work with orphans, some of them have either a one living parent or they have a guardians, they have relatives who, who they identify with. So the work has been about, you know, working with children and parents is like more of a, it's a cooperative. It's like, you know, raising children is a project, but it's, we don't get it through competing, like kids competing with parents or parents competing with kids and all that Mm. stuff but it's really about how do we cooperate so that we can build our family so that Mm. we can build and achieve the goals that we want to for the kids which is getting an education uh, so that you can break the cycle of of poverty in the homes so my approach has really been different because when i went to school in the west their idea of development Mm -hmm. and their idea of self-empowerment is based on a very individualistic framework. Mm. And I realized that for us, we are very communal. Mm -hmm. We are very uh, family-oriented, community-oriented. And at first, when you go to that system, it seems like there's something wrong with us. Mm. But then I came to realize that actually we need to harness our community spirit. So because that is how you build community, the individualistic um, Mm you know, attitudes of the West have not served them well because, okay, you can get all you want. You can build a big house, drive, if you can drive 12 cars, have 12 cars and things like that. But at the end of the day, they are lonely because you you build your life on, you know, what they think that achieving all these things is success. But really success is an aspect of the heart. You know, like how happy are you? Exactly. How satisfied yes. are you with? Yeah, you know. So what, what I realized then is that I wasn't, I wasn't going to build 
on a system of telling the kids, oh, you're better than the other, you must beat the other one so that okay. every, the, the competition mindset. I decided to build our work on the platform of cooperation. I am because you are. Okay. Right. So my, my, I talk about Ubuntu. Ubuntu, the African philosophy of I am because you are, is about how I am in relation okay. to community. I'm fully human in community. But I say there's something else called Utu. Utu is how Utu informs my Ubuntu. Uh. Utu is the humaneness that that informs my okay. being fully human in community. What do I bring? Okay. How do I bring it? So, so everything that, in totality. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, that that is what saved me. The understanding that whatever I learned, I could come and add value to it, but using my cultural richness, because we have that. And, and, and that has really created a very different kind of, a very different kind of project. Mm. Well, it seems as if you've really built all what you have said, you've really built it into what the different projects you're involved in. That brings me to, to my next question. Being that, you know, your organization has different projects like the Birth in Our Lives by Design, which you call BOLD, the 3G Eco Center, the College Scholars Program, and the Mani Children's Home. Now, how are you able to bring all of this together using yeah. the mission of your organization? Building cultures of peace. So... Note that I actually don't say we build a culture because a culture is like one thing. Okay. But I talk about building cultures. Cultures, cultures of, of peace. Peace. Okay. Yeah, because there are different strands and different aspects of our lives that inform who we be and who we become. Okay. So what I realized then is that I wanted to be a peace builder, but I wanted to understand what kind of peace builder I wanted to be by beginning with building that within myself first and foremost. Okay. If I have no peace, I cannot be a peacemaker or a peace builder with other people mm. because then I have no sense of, of what peace is. In fact, Mother Teresa said that um, we have no peace because we have forgotten we belong to each other. And for me, I add that uh, we've, forgotten who, we've forgotten who we are with each other because we've forgotten who we are. Mm. <laughs> you know, it has yeah. to begin with me. When I started the children's home, I realized that the development ethic has taught me to build things linearly. Mm. Build one project, take one child to school, let them succeed, and then build on, scale it up. That is what mm. they call it, scale it up. Okay. And, and I realized that when I pay school fees for one kid, and I don't look into the context within which that kid is living, he has no parents or he has one living parent who is sick or not able to take care of mm. him. The school that he goes to, the church community he goes to, I have to work within the context that that kid is growing up in. So what I realized then that it, it's not going to be linear. It's going to be circular. It's going to ripple out, you know? And it's going to go around. So then, yeah, it's circular. It's top down. Um, and, and it's longitudinal also, it's circular, you know what I mean. Yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> Top down, <laughs> it's, going to, it's going to go sideways and it's going to yeah. you know, come to the middle and affect, you know, it's going to bounce back, you know, and everybody will be affected. Yes. That's true. So then I realized that the children's home is not going, the children's home is not going to be an island. Okay. I wanted to bring in the community so that, because in the beginning, the community was saying that I keep kids who are HIV positive. So they, they didn't want to work with us. They were calling us the, the home of AIDS, you know. So there was discrimination at that time. Yeah, there was discrimination a lot at, at that time. And um, so, but then I also deliberately decided I wanted the kids to go to the public schools around so that they can integrate within the community. Because if I created my own school, then they will even be more isolated. So even today, the kids go to the public schools around us. We don't have okay. our own school yet. So then I decided it, it will be a center where the community comes to find its empoweredness, empowerment. Mm -hmm. For mm -hmm. me, I say empowerment is what someone does for you. Empoweredness 
is what you choose to do with that empowerment. Mm. So uh, what I did is that when we created the children's home, I realized that um, the children who had lost their parents when they were young could come to the children's home, but the kids who were in high school or primary school when their parents died dropped out of school. Okay. And then they, some of them went and got married. Now they've started having children and they're jobless and they married boys who are also not um, working. So they were, they were starting to be another problem in the community. So I decided to start a skills training program for those kinds of kids. But there were skills training programs and self-esteem building programs that my kids also at the children's home could attend. Then from there, I realized that um, um, we have women, if we didn't want, if we wanted to stop the flow of the uh, orphans, we needed to support the widows who were left so that when they have a skill and they can raise money for themselves, they can take care of their kids and then their kids don't have to go to the oh. streets. So that is where the support for the women came in. Okay. And then from there, I realized that those young people who got married early now are having children, needed to understand who they are. So we started what I call the New Generation Leaders Program. Okay. Which was a program to teach young people who they are and to discover their power. Because society has programmed us to look at ourselves as if we are the circumstances in our lives. And my belief is that I'm not my failures. I am the courage that enables me to wake up dust up and move on with my life. You must have been doing a lot of counseling and motivation because it seems a lot of hard work, but you must have been drilling for people to start seeing themselves differently, that you're not yeah. to be blamed for your circumstances. So what I realized then is I, it is not possible to do one project because all these things are feeding on how do I want to bring up this child so that by the time they leave the children's home, they are a, a whole kind of human person who okay. knows who they are, who knows what their vision for life is and all that stuff, and who have recovered from the trauma of losing their parents early to understand exactly that it's not their fault and things like that. So then when we did that and the children started coming to live at the children's home, then I, I realized, geez, I have never brought up more than one child. How am I going to raise 10, 20, 30 and now we are 73. <laughs> 73 <laughs> kids. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So, <laughs> yeah, I know. And like, imagine, imagine, imagine a mother with 73 kids. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, and right now, if you think of COVID-19, we are at home. All of so us. So how are you coping? Uh, what we did is that uh, immediately COVID-19 was announced, we locked our gate to outsiders. Okay. No one comes in. And so we know we are kind of contained. And so we, we live just like a family. Mm. So, I mean, for all of us here, there's no way we can do social distancing. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, well, um, um, Karambu, you seem to have your hands full. You have a lot of projects for women who are positive. To, you also have projects for people, young people to go into leadership. You have the children's home. You have the the eco center now you have to pay staff um, and i'm sure you don't use volunteers all the way for all the different projects you have to close the children buy food school fees you also have to give money to women to support and make them to be able to sustain themselves now where does the funding come from so when i started doing the work that i was doing um a, a lot of our funding was coming from, remember, uh, once I started in 2002, um, I, I, I graduated in 2007. So every year I did the Kenya Cultural Event, and then I started finding people who were interested in supporting the, sponsoring the children. So a lot of my funding, I started building that in the U.S. Okay. I also have um, the women's program especially is supported by a partner that we have in the UK. And then I have other, other organizations in Europe, in Hong Kong, that send us like probably money for paying school fees, money for keeping the kids at the children's home and stuff like that. But over and above that, I realized that that, that is not sustainable mm. because 
2008, when the global economy went down, some people lost their money, so they couldn't support us anymore. So I started building a sustainability program or project for us. And that's where the Echo Center comes in. So mm -hmm. I started growing our own food at the Echo Center. We have two pieces of land outside of where we live, where we grow our own corn and beans and fruits and things like that. And then we also built um, an Airbnb kind of space where people can come and stay for pay. Mm. We ha bought a safari van. So we I can think I, I will come there to come and see how it looks like. <laughs> you really have to come and see because it's, not, it's like nothing anyone has done. Yeah. And uh, we also have a public uh, transport vehicle. We use it for the children's home, but I also use it to ferry people around and they pay. So we have wow. all these plans <laughs> that have help bring in money because this is amazing learned, yeah and that's how that's how we work here like now because all the staff have gone the older children are helping me at the children's home we cook we clean and we teach each other the university students are teaching the high school kids the high school kids are teaching the primary school kids so it's really a space where any kid who who has the right mind will grow and move out and become an amazing citizen. So, so what's the age range of the children? Three years. Our youngest kid came here when they were one year, one year old. Mm -hmm. And so right now they've all grown. Uh, the, the, the latest one came when she was three and now she's five. So right now we have from five to 24 years old. And the 24 year olds are in the in university. In fact, five of them are graduating this year. If you must be a very lasts. proud. You must be a very proud mother. Absolutely, I am for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You need to come. You need to come and see it. I will. I will talk to you about it. I will talk to you about it. So when you look back at when it started for you in 2002, when mm. you look back, what would you say has been your greatest achievement? My greatest achievement has been the kids. Recently, I had one of the kids talk somewhere. I, she, I, I don't know what we were talking about in, in a group of people in one of our new generation leaders programs. And I had this kid say, I may be an orphan, but I'm not the one who is dead. So for me, for a kid to get who they are is not their circumstances. It was like, wow, this is, this is it. Exactly. So, yeah. because most of the kids who have lost their parents, you know, like they wallow in the, in the, in the, in the sorrow of, I don't have parents, no, no, no. I'm like, these kids are taking the, their lives in their hands. So that's for the children. For the women, um, I have, I have a, a number of women who, when we started, couldn't even pay, buy uniform. You know, uniform, like 25, yeah. 25 yeah. cents. Yeah. And after they went through our program and did a skills training program, they now have been able to take their kids through university. Okay. They have paid school fees for university. And for me, that has been amazing. None of them come to ask me for money anymore. They, they actually bring me things now. They bring, <laughs> they make and sell. And so for me, that's a great achievement because they don't come to ask for things. They are coming now to bless us. And in the last four years, we have trained about a thousand young, young women and men on what we call the New Generation Leaders Program. And it teaches them to really know who they are and to choose what they want to do with their lives. And I'm telling you, half of them, I'm talking about a thousand kids, half of them have either started their own projects or are involved in, in, in initiatives, youth-led initiatives that they invite me now to just go and, uh, you know, like motivate them and things like that. That's absolutely wonderful. You have been giving and they, they are now giving back to you. And I'm sure exactly. when you look at what you've achieved, you must be at the same time collaborating with uh, maybe other organizations who actually share your values and your ideals, I guess. Yeah, you can never work alone. So what I say is that um, the tragedy of our people is when they don't know who they are. The tragedy mm. of a person is when they don't know who they are. Mm. Because when you know who you are, that you know I am, I am because you are, and I'm fully human in community, you can never work alone. Because you don't know, I don't know everything. I really don't know much. <laughs> but you know what can you work? 
<laughs> yeah. Teamwork. <laughs> what the other people has, has, has taught me the power of the power of making things happen in community. But the most important learning I've, I've done is, you know, the way we say we are helping people, there's no one who is helpless and hopeless. Mm. We have taken agency from people so that we can justify helping them and giving exactly. them aid. Mm. But when you listen to people and when you allow the so-called victims, mm. they are not victims. We have victimized them so that we can make money off of them. But when you allow them to see who they are and what they can achieve, that is what I've learned from the women and the children. I mean, they have taught me more than I can say I have given them. I mm. have learned so much from them. And I have learned that when someone knows who they are, you cannot stop them. The societal programming and conditioning through systems and, and ideology and stuff like that, that is what keeps people, that is what keep, keeps people boxed and so they, once you get out of that box, then you're free. That's freedom for me. Getting out of the societal boxes of the programs, the programming that they have done for us. <laughs> so where do you see yourself, say, in the next 10 years? Where do you see IPI? You know, this coronavirus has come with amazing um, <laughs> opportunities for reflection. Exactly. And, 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 and really focusing on what is important. So right now I'm going through the process of weeding, pruning, and really looking at what is the core of what I want to do in the next 10 years. And what I have decided and I'm growing, I'm still thinking, uh, reflecting through this, is the creation of a foundation. Um, I started it actually uh, last year, the foundation. I call it 3G Foundation. And it, I have decided that I really want to build on what we have achieved right now in terms of i know aid and development the way we have been taught doesn't work mm. it perpetuates the dependency mindset mm. and so what i'm the foundation is going to do is it is going to um find ways to 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 raise funds to enable like these young people that i've worked with with the women that i've worked with those who have created their own programs to build um, their capacity and or whatever it is that they need so that they can grow their programs, not within the framework of aid and development, okay. but through, through the, the thinking of um, a systems thinking approach that talks about empoweredness, reclaiming, reclaiming our voice, our agency, and really you know, grounding our development on our spirituality, because that's something that we've lost. And you cannot develop as a human being holistically if you've forgotten your spiritual roots. So development based on spiritual, our spiritual grounding is, is what I am developing now. There's something I'm taking away from what you have said so far that, <laughs> yes, I am, I am who you are. I am yeah. who you are. I must say, Dr. Karambu, it's been a pleasure. You have said so much. And as a woman, as a mother, trained a lot and you continue to train. No, we can't help but wish you all the best. So as the founder and president of um, the International Peace Initiatives, Dr. Karambu Regina, we say a very big thank you to you for having a chat with Alternative Africa today. Thank you very, very much. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me and be safe and stay healthy. Say as well to the children and the women down there. Thank you very Thank much you. again. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye.